Lord, we want to thank you, God, just for the gift of today, Lord, that you've given us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the gift of just this time that, that we can set aside in the midst of the, our work week and you know, the families and the many things that are going on um, in the world around us, Lord. But you give us the grace to set aside time, God, that we can hear from you, that we can receive instruction from your word to us. And so, Lord, we just, uh, I just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would fill us freshly now. Uh, each man in here, or the person listening, myself including God, is that your Spirit would come and would rightly divide uh, these truths, Lord, uh, to, to our hearts, Lord, to our lives, Lord. That we might not just uh, walk away as uh, though we were staring in a mirror and forget what we look like. But, Lord, we would... Uh, look into the, the things that your word says to us tonight, Lord, and, and God, your spirit would draw out as, as we uh, go our way, or even as we sit here, uh, give us insight and vision uh, of how we might be better doers of these truths, God, because it's the doer of the word that's blessed, that's, that's what we want to be at, God, uh, spirit empowering very empowered doers of the word. So Lord, we just uh, ask you to open up our hearts to, to your word, your word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So, uh, we're going to be in Malachi chapter 2. And if you weren't here last week, um, started on the end of this book, Malachi chapter 1. Try not to... Uh, Got a whole notes in here somewhere. <laughs> I'm trying to go back and read the whole thing, but no, go back through the, the entire intro. But you know, Malachi time frame is just shortly after Nehemiah, so you get sort of an idea. You know, your Bible doesn't necessarily the books doesn't line up like that in that chronology, but that just gives you sort of a time frame. It's the last book, obviously, uh, before leading into the New Testament. I do think you know, as I was pondering this a little bit. And I'm pondering this too. Um, you know, if you look at Daniel chapter 11, or if you want to go online and listen to that Bible study, I remember teaching through it, there's a lot of prophecies. There's tons of prophecies in that one chapter. But it does give specifics. Daniel, the prophet, God gives him specifics about the gap, so to speak, of those 400 years, you know, leading into the New Testament. You know, he kind of lays out the kings that would be coming into power at the very least. Uh, and so, so those sort of things. So in a sense, you know, God speaks to that time. You know, but there is a gap uh, as, in, as the sense is of uh, his word to his people uh, as it ends off in Malachi leading to the New Testament. So, but we'll pick up here in Malachi, the first Italian prophet, right? Now Malachi uh, chapter 2. And Malachi, you know, his name again means my messenger. Some people speculate, was he a real person? Was it just maybe Ezra or somebody like that? You know, I tend to lean that he's a real person. But, uh, and again, it's one of those books, I don't know if you caught it last time, I talked about it, I think, I want to say 47 of the 52 verses is like God speaking in a first person sort of format. So it's uh, one of the Old Testament books that's just, just, just in, just like, just a pack full of God saying things specific. So there's that. So Malachi chapter 2. And we left off talking about, um, you know, God bringing the correction to the people about some of the offerings, some of the lame offerings that were being brought to him as a correction. And the Lord continues to correct. And he starts into this chapter correcting the priest. And I do think it's... Uh, Interesting because I think it's consistent how the Lord deals with people in the Bible throughout. You know, it says in Peter that judgment begins with the house of God, first and foremost. God ends up, He deals with the people. And he, he does with other nations and other things like that. We see that in the Bible also. But the, the narratives toward people more often than not first. And so that, that, that's a thing, you know, as we kind of look at this, and He's dealing here specifically with the priests who were essentially the ministers of God. You know, we see in the Hebrew Scriptures and in this time frame, because the temple has now been put together, the walls are built up around it, 
there's been some practicing of the, the back of the things of the temple back in the Exodus that we talked about. Some of that's been going on. So we saw the lousy sacrifices, the haphazard sacrifices last week. And we'll pick up here verse 1 of chapter 2. And it says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you keep, will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts. I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. You know, and, um, this is one of the things you see in 2 Timothy 3, 5, chapter 2, 3, chapter, yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. I wrote down this verse. It says, having a form of godliness. This is the symptoms of people in the last days. They have a form of godliness. But they deny its power. And it says, such, from such people turn away. That's in, we could say, our day. Right. And we see this here in Malachi with the priests. That God is saying to them, you're not giving glory to my name there in verse 2. And we remember we talked briefly about this last week, but the name, the gravity of a name in you know, the Hebrew Scriptures was very weighty. You know, it was uh, based on your reputation, based on your character, based on the works that you did. The, it was all somewhat embedded in the name. It was an identity sort of thing. And so for them not to give glory that was due to God's name was a very uh, big indictment that the Lord is speaking against here. And he's saying, we just read that, that I will curse, send a curse upon you. Because you're not taking this to heart. You're not really in, embodying these things. And this can, this can happen to any one of us. Let's just be real for that. Especially if you've been a Christian for any length of time. You know, you can come and, you know, the Tuesday night thing, the Thursday or the Sunday or maybe your life group or even devotions with your wife. It could be, could, could be just a ho-hum sort of thing if we're not careful, if we don't take it to heart. You know, and that's, that's something that for us to, as an application, we should walk away with this for sure. But he's cursing the blessing, cursing the blessings that they already have. He says, yes, I curse them because you do not take it to heart. And I don't know if you've been in those seasons of life. I know that I have been in those seasons of life where you realize you're blessed. Hopefully you're able to uh, think, you know, well, I'm way more blessed than somebody in the third world for sure. Mm -hmm. Or at least, right? You know, I'm, I'm blessed practically. Uh, we actually, you know, it's, I've, I've talked about this periodically, but, you know, in human history, there's not been a better time to be a human being than human history and be alive. In terms of the practical blessings, the comfort that, that, that we have and stuff like that. It's, it's amazing. It really is. I mean, it's incomparable. It's incomparable to any other time in human history. But if we consider that, you know, I've, I've been in moments in my life where I've been blessed, sort of realized it but not walking with the Lord, and all of a sudden those blessings are like curses. You know, like, it's like, you know, your family's a blessing, right? Generally speaking. <laughs> right? 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 There should be a blessing. Your wife is a blessing. You know, the Bible says, you know, he finds a wife, finds a good thing. But sometimes, if we're not taking to heart the things of God, it can seem like a curse. It's like, ah, you know, this woman, argh, you know, she does that thing, you know. And it, and it can seem like a curse. Or your kids, you know, they're, they're like such a blessing, you know, until they're able to talk back to you. They're like, man, what's the matter with this kid, you know? All of a sudden, it seems like a curse. And it's not to say that everybody's heart is, you know, away from the Lord because you have a bad day with your spouse or your family or, you know, things that you have that normally bless you that sometimes you take for granted, like a laundry machine goes down, like, dang, you know? You're, it was a blessing, and then you realize it's not working. You're like, oh, please, you know, it's a blessing. It's cursed right now. Or your phone stops working, or a number of other things. I had my device mess up yesterday at work. Now, sometimes that's, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, right? Bob talks about that, right? Sometimes that's just 
living on planet Earth. But it should, from time to time, and this does keep you on the edge in your walk with the Lord. It does for me, at the very least. You know, when sometimes when things go away, sometimes it's, it's a moment to just, in a healthy way, Lord, you know, you're wanting me to introspect about something. You know, <laughs> that's going on in my life. It's not to say, you know, that you're having a Job moment, you know, where things are going in disarray. Like I said, the just, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Or you live in a fallen world, you know, where things just go bad. Things sometimes go bad because you share the gospel or you're standing for righteousness. You know, that, that's a reality too. You know, and that, that, that can be a good thing. You know, if it's going wrong and you realize maybe you've neglected something Jesus has told you to do, maybe it's a moment to say, hey, you know, Lord, maybe this is this thing. You know, you're, this is, blessing is blowing up in my face right now. <laughs> this is supposed to be a blessing, but it's not working the way it should. So maybe, maybe that's the Lord to take note of. So God is saying here specifically to these priests, hey, you know what, your blessings are cursed. You know, for them, it's very specific. But Verse 3, it says, Behold, so he goes a little further here to the dealing with the priest. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. Now, the word refuse there is uh, mm -hmm. dung, mm -hmm. right? This is a little, uh, God's a little more upfront in dealing with these people. I mean, you know, it's a bunch of grateful that Jesus turned over tables and said, doing this in the temple, right? This was a bad situation. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, I mean, this is, and this is not something that God's telling a prophet to do or anything like that. And obviously, I think we can get the gist of this. This is, I believe, hyperbolic language the Lord is using. I mean, he's not using the hand that wrote on the wall and started to smear stuff on the priest's face for being disobedient or anything like that. But there is there is that connotation that, man, I'm sick of what you're bringing to the table here. You know, in reference to the solemn feast, if you remember, uh, actually I spoke on this, if you're attending the verse by verse study in Exodus, talked about um, I don't remember the chapter, but it was uh, offerings that were made before Aaron and the priests were consecrated. There was actually um, a thing that they did with the bull and the excrement of the bull. Uh, and it also explains it further in Exodus, in Exodus 29 14. In another section it says, But the flesh of the bull with its skin and its ophal, that's the New King James version of dung. Was, that was a new word in my vocabulary. <laughs> but uh, it says, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. And so there is this sense that it says, the refuse of your solemn feast, and one will take and one will take you away with it. So there's a sense that it wasn't being done properly, perhaps, is what I'm getting to. The sacrifice that was being offered, this is something that should have been done outside the camp. And, you know, now dung was used for another number of Things in some cases you see in the Bible is sometimes used as like, you know, lighting stuff on fire, you know, and use it to, to make fire. Not like that was the primary resource, okay? You know, that stuff stuff's kind of weird. But, you know, it's, um, it was one of those kind of things. Yeah, instead of lighting a match, they set the whole thing on fire. But Deuteronomy uh, 23, 12 through 13 also talks about you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go. And you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig it and turn it over your refuse. So it was both personal and practical, and as it dealt with the sacrifices. And this is actually good practical advice to go camping and there's no port johns anywhere. But you know, outside the camp, right? <laughs> that's 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 the thing, you know, that, that this stuff is for or where it goes. Now verse 4. It says, Then you shall know that I sent this commandment to you. This is what the wake-up call is supposed to, and you know, this thing that God's saying He will do. This is what you're going to know from that. That my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. I gave them to him that he might fear me. That's the covenant of ministering the, the things of God in the temple. 
that's the covenant of ministering the things of the Word of God. We're going to see further. It says, So he feared me and was reverent before my name. Verse 6. The law of truth was in his mouth. The Word of God should have been in his mouth. And injustice was not found on his lips. So there was the sense of the Word, the law, being applied rightly. So it wasn't somebody was getting the you know, shorthanded or things weren't going wrong in that sense. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. This was the covenant that God had intended that the, the priests would have, the Levites would have. There would be... Uh, they would, they would revere God's word in such a way that they had life and peace in them and that they might fear the Lord. You know, you see, I did a study here once a while back, and God should have brought you in. But if you do a study, just do a word study on the phrase, the fear of the Lord. It's not, the, the, the things that surround it are not negative. They're very positive. It says the fear of the Lord is clean, you know, um, the fear of the Lord helps, you know, it talks, talks about here, but in other places helps you depart from iniquity. You know, it's, it's actually something that's healthy. You know, usually you hear that phrase or that word fear, you know, and sometimes in our initial view of it, I think we can get a negative connotation like God's trying to, you know, just be scary or something like that. And the, the sense that, that the Lord, I believe, wants us to have is we have a reverent respect for what God is saying. And we adhere to it to do it. There is life, like it says in these verses, and there is peace in the Lord. And we might struggle, we all do, in some form or fashion in our flesh with doing the right thing. And there's that war, you know, the spirits wanting us to do what God's word says. And, the flesh is like, you know, used to seeing the way other men behave in business or used to seeing the way other men do things at work or used to seeing the way other people behave themselves as it pertains to just the practical laws and the authority underneath our culture, right? You know, we're used to seeing that method versus what we know that the Lord is instructing us to follow and to do. And sometimes we battle, right? You know, we joked about the speed limit and stuff last week. But, you know, but just, you know, there's that sense, though, if we're willing, you know what, Lord? What is right in your eyes, according to your word, when you're engaging in a task, be it business, be it work, be it your household, be it your family? And if we know what God's word says about that, and we choose to revere him, so be, be in a sense afraid to not do what he says. You know, because you don't want to get young spit in your face. But, uh, but you know, this is, you know, but, but you, 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 if you do that, you know, you, you'll have life. And you have peace and, and on all the good things that God intends for you to have. You know, and, and it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that the Lord desires for us. As we walk in, in His truth. And to be blessed in His ways. Um, you know, it says there in that last, uh, like that. You know, one of the characteristics of having, you know, God's Word and revering it. You know, it's, you know, when you revere it, it's, it's in your mouth. It's, it's, um, there's no sense of injustice found on the lips. So there's not this thing of like, you know, you want to misapply God's word or extrapolate verses just to get it to mean what you think it should mean. You know, but rightly dividing the word we talked about before. But um, there's a, so there's equity there. But it's, I like that phrase um, at the end of verse 6, turn many away from iniquity. Turn many away from iniquity. Um, you see in the Lotus and the Proverbs and, and other places in the Bible, there's some good stuff surrounding this, but this is, you know, it's a, it talks about the ungodly and then it talks about the godly, you know, those who keep the law contend with the ungodly. It speaks of that in Proverbs. I like uh, 2 Timothy 2.19, as followers of Jesus, this is a great verse. It says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation is of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
That's, that's the call of Jesus in us. Causes us to depart from those things that aren't from the Lord. More and more, degree by degree, day by day. And none, none of us ever get it completely until we're with Him. You know, in a perfect environment like heaven. <laughs> you know, but we can continue by the Spirit of God grow in that direction. That's what the Word is intended to do. You know, Daniel 12.3, it says, Those who are wise shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn away, we turn many to righteousness. So there's not this, you know, we often think, yeah, turn away from sin. But it's, it's more about not just the sin of, uh, what we call it, the sin of uh, commission, you know, <coughs> doing a thing. But there's, there's the sin of omission if we're involved in the sin of commission because we're doing the wrong thing. We're obviously not doing the right thing. You know, and so there is that sense that the Word of God calls us to not just yeah stop that That's stupid stuff, <laughs> no, but no, it calls us to you know what do good to your neighbor, to, to to love others the way that He loved you, right? And not extrapolate that, call it the golden rule, and don't give Jesus any glory for it. Don't do that. <laughs> but but honor the Lord in those ways, and you turn people to righteousness, you shine. That's the thing that Daniel did in his walk, in his work, who was not uh, serving in a priest capacity necessarily, but served in a kingship, in an administrative capacity. It's cool stuff. Now verse 7, Malachi chapter 2, verse 7. And it continues on. Some of the so there's some good meaty stuff there in that last few verses, but it continues there a little bit. Verse 7 is for the lips of a priest should keep knowledge. Should keep knowledge. And people should seek the law from his mouth. We're to be that living epistle, that living letter, that poema that talks about Ephesians chapter 2. D.A. did this a little bit Sunday, I think. But you know, we're, we're to be that living word. And people should seek the word from his mouth, the priest in this day, but the, the life of the gospel in our day. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And all of us, in some form or fashion, like it or not, if you have the ability to speak or communicate, are called to be a messenger in some form or fashion. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a reality. It is, there's no exemptions. You know, when, it, when you look through the scriptures carefully, I don't think there's any exemptions for, for, for you to sh not be sharing as a follower of Jesus. I mean, we're, we're going to read a section here in a minute when it gets into this. It goes, it kind of switches gears and it gets into uh, God indicts the, uh, the marriage relationship being neglected. But there's an instruction there. So if you're an uh, RA husband and you're in this room. You're instructed by God to communicate the Word of God, help wash your wife into the Word of God. So, you can't do that without communicating. I mean, you know, the Word should be on your lips, right? You know, that's, that's the thing. you got to have it in there to, to be sharing. And some of that, you know, as you grow, I mean, you're not going to always have everything all the time. That's why, I mean, it's, it's great to uh, set aside time for devotion and whatnot. Healthy things to do. Uh, Proverbs uh, ten twenty one says the lips of the righteous feed many. Uh, I want to read this section real quick with you. I thought it was good. I just uh, felt like the Lord made me go here. John's Gospel. If you want to turn there, you can follow along. I'm just going to read a few verses. Chapter twenty one. In uh, verse fifteen, I thought this was. I was encouraged by this. When I thought of it, and I read it, and I was like, maybe I should read this whole thing. And this is the end, obviously, of the Gospel of John, but, you know, there's the instance that Peter had had this gap in his fellowship with Christ between the time he denied Jesus, if you remember, remember the story, three times the rooster crows and whatnot. There had been a gap in the time frame in which Peter had engaged Jesus as it relates to some of these things. You know, there was the initial resurrection and he appeared for him and stuff like that. But 
we kind of see some things addressed here. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, this is Jesus after he appeared to them, made them breakfast. They saw him, they were excited. Jesus looks to Peter and says, Son of Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to them the third time, remember Peter, the nine three times, right? He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. There's actually, a, I don't want to get into it, there's a play on the word there, love. Uh, sometimes it's phileo in that text, which is more of a friendship type of love. Peter's responding, no, I don't want to get into that. But it, and sometimes it's agape, you know, as Jesus is talking. But that's not my point on this text. But Jesus said, and feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say it, and we'll just leave it there. Verse 17, he said, feed my sheep. So three times, Peter's admonishing Peter, you know, in terms of this reciprocal love relationship, there is this thing for you, Peter. Feed sheep. You never really see in the Gospels Jesus really hashing this thing out with Peter. Remember, remember, I saw you at the corner of my eye there back in the dark. You know, the thing, you burn your hands. The little girl, they're there talking to you, Peter. Remember that? You don't see him like bringing up all the denials, you know, and hashing out all the wrongs. What is he doing? He's turning him to righteousness. He's not jumping up and down, wrong here, wrong here, wrong here. Instead of addressing it in that way, he knew enough about the situation. Peter knew he did what was wrong, whatever. But he's saying, feed my sheep. This is your role. He's turning him toward what's right. That's what I'm calling you to do. And that's, that's really the call of us as followers of Jesus is in some form or fashion is to have these words on our lips ready to share. Now verse 8. It says, But you have departed from the way you have caused many. Again, God's indicting the priest. You know, told him this is what you should be doing. But you've departed from this way and you've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I made you contemptible and base before all the people, <coughs> because you've not kept <coughs> but have shown partiality in the law. So God is making it plain because you've not took this to heart. You're causing people to stumble. You now. Does this mean that the priests were out there just, you know, just like cheering people on to do wrong things? Go worship Moloch! Go worship some other gods! Go do this! I don't think that was the case. It was not taking serious, not taking to heart the things that the Lord had already laid out for them to do. The Lord was already laid out for them to do. The, 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 how to do the, the sacrifice. All this stuff was laid out. It was because they weren't taking that to heart. You know, one of the things is um, it talks about, I want to say it's Hosea, there's my correct me if I'm wrong on that. It talks about a famine of hearing the word of God. Not a famine that God's word is not available in any written form anywhere. It was just a famine from, from them being able to hear. Take the heart, if you will. The word of God. And I don't think in our culture today, I don't think we lack for seminars, you know, or lack for, you know, information. I mean, in any way, shape, or form. I mean, we, we got, like, I mean, I mean, dude, you get to stay, I tell people now, like, that are new in the Lord, let's do it, I can't do it now. But you can go to that Bible app, you version app, man, and just download that thing, get a Bible, or every language version. You know, it's amazing. And you could just do verse notification reminders, all this stuff. You can just so enter a word, go to plans, enter a word, marriage, uh, whatever, depression. 
این فرمو بابل استادی کنه این فرمو تن بابل استادی کنه Great men of God out there. You just like, just boom, 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 boom. And I encourage you guys, you know, go for it, man. If you're trying to oh, feel like the Lord's stirring you about a subject or something, or maybe even a marriage study, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But I mean, man, just, just start reading through one, you know? Be blessed, you know? That's totally available. And yet I run into people constantly on a day to day that just, like, I'll share something. It's common maybe to us men in here, right? You know, I'd say something, yeah, I've heard that before, you know, I've thought about that before, but I stare at somebody out there in the world, yeah, like, it's like they've never heard this before in their life. Like, where did you get this glorious information? And I'm like, well, it's right here, it's a little, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cheat sheet, you know, the Lord's words right here about that subject, you know. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's there. And yet, People aren't doing it. And because of that, God's saying, you know what, all the people, you're going to be content, held in contempt before the people. They're not going to respect you because you're not taking these things to heart. Because you're not taking these things to heart. People are stumbling around. You know, this just brings it in, in the question. I've addressed this before, but it's what well worth its weight and ruminating on it and considering it. And a lot of the stuff we see in the scriptures, man, that's, that's just what it is. It's just, we're just trying to get back to what the Lord is saying. You know, I uh, really hate it when people look at something and they say, you yeah, I've heard that before. You know, blah, 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 blah. So what? You know, I mean, maybe you've done a push-up before, but it's a lot different if you do 100. <laughs> it might be the same form and the same push-up, but if you do 100, it feels different. You apply that word 100 times, you read it 100 times, it looks a little different. The Holy Spirit illuminates it, right? But anyway, but you know, there's this thing where I believe in our culture, it's a, it's a lie, it's a subtle lie. But people think that they sin to themselves. Like I'm going home and I got the little whatever liquor cabinet or I got these websites I want to look at or, you know, and nobody else knows except for the one who's before whose eyes everything's naked and open, right? I mean, the Lord Himself knows, but we think, you know, I'm not really hurting anybody. But I believe there's that's a lie. Because what if you were taking that, whatever you're doing, and maybe it's not completely evil. Maybe you know, I, I get caught. I see that myself get caught in things that most of you wouldn't be like, yeah, whatever. But you wouldn't think it's evil. But you know, I have to look at it not from what you think about it. Or even what I think about it. I have to look at it from, Lord, Lord, is this what I should be doing right now? You know, that's, that's what I have this perspective I need to have. And so there are those type things, and, and I think it's important to know that, because if you're not, whatever, if you're not taking to heart certain things in certain ways, it, it can cause your wife, it can cause your family, it can cause other people that God has put you in a sphere of influence over, maybe it's your workplace or whatever the case may be, to stumble into something they shouldn't. Because just think about it. If you were studying something and you were like vigorously studying, just you were sold out, focused on that, you weren't looking at all this other stuff on TV and other things, but you were just really sold out on what God was saying in His Word, you were looking at it undistracted, right? If you had that wholeheartedly embraced, what's going to happen? Jesus says that abundance of your heart, your mind for what? Speak, 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 right? So you, you're bracing. Somebody bumps into you. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, I'm thinking about this. <laughs> you know? And guess what? That thing that you may have been meditating on may alter that person's day. It may alter that person's perspective about the Lord in a way you never thought of. You know? So just considerations. I don't mean you to always share everything about everything every time. I ain't saying that's the case either. But obviously if you doing that and you're not doing your job and then somebody bumps into you and you say, whoa, why aren't you doing your job? You know? That's, that's kind of messed up there, right? Just go back to the Colossians chapter 3, the Harvard Harley Lord, right? But just, but anyway, so there's, there's those things and I think God sees it for what it is. That's the important thing. we got to have the Lord's perspective. God sees it for what it is. I'm not judging you, God. I'm just telling you considerations uh, from the Lord. Maybe. Verse 10. kind of switches gears a bit. Verse 10 says, 
Have we not all one Father, and has not God created us? So it's not, I think the Lord's not speaking in this sense. Father Malachi. Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Hmm. Not only is this viewed as stumbling people, but it's seen as treachery. It's seen as profaning the covenant that God's established. Saying, aren't, aren't we part of the same family? So apparently there's an addressing of things that are taken in respect of this not taking God's word to heart. Treachery and covenant is being dealt out to one another, maybe among the priesthood. You know, since it just came off the cusp of that. I mean, there's sort of like this, you know, this looking at each other like, you know, I mean, I'm really thankful I don't see that happen. I mean, I'm saying it's not possible or things can't happen, but among like I think like pastoral folks that are here, I don't I don't see that. You know, praise God, you know, pray for it now. <laughs> you know, but no, but just you know, where where it's like, you know, Oh, look at that guy over there. You know, maybe some of that was what was happening here. And there was sort of this mental competition about things. Or, well, that guy's getting more out of the temple taxes than we are, you know. Maybe there's this sort of this stuff that lingered. You know, I was thinking of, uh, and this was, I, I was just reading this today. I just had to read this, this little section, Luke 15. I was reading the thing about the older brother, you know. And about how his attitude was when God had restored the lost prodigal. And, you know, he kind of looks at the father with contempt. And in a sense, like, you know what, God, I'm doing it. Or, like, you could say that it's related to God in a sense. Sort of picture that the, the text is. But it's like, you know what, I've been working for you and doing all this stuff. He's having a big party, cookout. Amazing time. And I can't kill you. I can't get a goat, you know. I get a goat. My boys. My buddies over here. And so there's a sense of looking at God in contempt in the way God's choosing to manage his resources. Remember the kind of coincided with that, the, the parable. Jesus sent out the workers. He agreed to work for a denarius, which is you know, a day's wage. You know, and the guys, they get a denarius, right? And they hired some more people later in the day, you know, and they agreed to work for a denarius. So at the end of the day, the people that came last got paid first, and they were all getting a denarius. And the guys were working 10 hours, see the guys working three hours, making a day's wage. Like, hey, what are we going to get? You know, I work 10, we work three, so maybe that means three times more, you know, just adding it up in their head. And then, boom, they get a denarius. <laughs> Go. What are you doing? <laughs> Nobody thinks like that, right? But no, but it's there's this sense of contempt in the way the resources the Heavenly Father is providing. And obviously in Christ, you know what we're getting those the person that gets saved that lives a garbage life is gonna be able to come into the kingdom just as much as the person that's trying to be disciplined and denying flesh and those kind of things, you know. People like, man, I should have sold my wild oats before I got saved. You know, look at this guy. He just gets right in. You know? I mean, there's these perceptions that exist where it causes an infight. Right? You know? Galatians, uh, let me turn to Galatians 5 through this short little bit. A couple minutes, I'm going to try to switch gears again. Uh, Galatians 5 26. Most of the 25. It says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and envying one another. You know, the Lord is extremely... And it's interesting how the Lord pulls these little pictures out. The prodigal, the, you know, the wage thing with the denarius, you know. Because the contempt is, in those scenes, and maybe in this scene as well, in some way, perhaps, in Malachi, that uh, there's contempt toward how God's managing things. There's contempt on how God's blessing people or not blessing people. And that causes 
people to behave differently. I mean, think about it. Seriously, if you work 10 hours for whatever, Mike Colt or something, <laughs> and Mike gave the same thing to the bum that came in and only worked three hours, like, dude, 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 <clears throat> 10 hours, you know what I mean? Three, 10, three, 10. Get the math straight here, right? You know, <laughs> you know but um, it just shows how easy, though, it is for us to to get caught in that situation if we're not careful. Then let's move on, verse 11. Judah, calling out specific tribes. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, Historically, there was a truth of that in Genesis 30, Genesis 30, Judah, Tamar, and there was some mixed baggage going on, some inappropriate things going on there. Maybe, you know, God sometimes speaks in that way. Uh, I believe it's more present is, is likely the situation here. So there's this intermarriage that's inappropriate. God has laid out the, the way things should be. And it's not happening. He's, you know, he's not told, he's instructed to not go to those outside of the faith, is what he's saying. You know, uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, I think chapter 6, speaks of not being unequally yoked as followers of Jesus. And it's, it's an important thing to know. It's an important thing, yeah, like, yeah, I'm good, okay, I'm good, it's fine. We want to project that on to the next generation. If we know that, we should, amen, somebody that's outside of Christ, and don't. I'll be going that direction. You know, I love what uh, was it John Corson told his daughter. He says, you know, go with somebody that loves, that, that knows the Lord and loves the Lord more than you. And then shortly thereafter, she got in an accident and was with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And his son came in and said, you know what, Daddy found, she found the guy with the Lord. You know, I mean, that's, that's a good admonition. You know, somebody that loves Jesus and is walking in spiritual stability. And it's faithful, right? Not just like says they're Christian, right? I mean, look at these guys, right? <laughs> He's rebuking earlier, right? You don't want to marry that priest, you know? It's half she's not taking these things to heart. And has done no space. But anyway, verse 10, or verse 11. Or no, I'm sorry, I read that. Verse, 11, verse 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware. Yet he brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. So there's sort of this shock. It's like, you're bringing an offering in? You're doing this, and you're bringing an offering in. Really? Really? You know, Nehemiah jumped on top of this a few years earlier. See how he dealt with it. Nehemiah 13, 25 through 31. Nehemiah ran into a similar situation. He says, so I contended with them and cursed them. So... I don't know what that means. What kind of profanity <laughs> Nehemiah was using in the ancient days? Struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor their daughters for your sons or yourselves. So you're getting sort of like a layout how to do this with your family. <laughs> Extended family. Strike, curse, contend, pull out hair. Okay. Make them swear by the Lord. <laughs> you shall not do this. Did not Solomon, he uses Solomon as an example, did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things, yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Verse 27 of Nehemiah 13. And it says, Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sambalat, the Horite. Therefore, I drove him from me. And that wasn't in a car. Verse 30, 25, it says, remember them. I mean, you could say a similar implication, maybe. But, no, but uh, remember them, oh my God, because they had defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of Levites. Thus I cleansed them of everything pagan. I also assigned duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service. So 
Nehemiah not just didn't cut off the bad, but he instructed into the good. That's the important thing, you know, it's again that Christianity exists where it's just stop doing it. And that's all we do. You know, there's no let's do good, let's serve the poor and the needy, those who are in prison and the orphan and stuff like that. You know, don't hear that. But anyway. It says, Thus I cleanse them every pain thing, also the sign of the verse 31, bringing wood to offering the first fruits of the times. Remember me, O God, for my good. That's Nehemiah. Just not too, at least a couple decades maybe or so prior to this, maybe three decades perhaps. You know, this, this is what he was doing in dealing with these people. Now, verse 13, it says, in Malachi, it says, And this is the second thing you do. So God says this is the second thing that happens. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so He does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. And the implication is that they've got into these inappropriate relationships, and they're at the altar weeping before God. Oh, yeah, it's very disturbing. You know, that's, <laughs> this is some of what may be happening here. As they're bringing the offering in. Maybe other petitions, maybe other supplications. And God's not regarding them. He's not hearing this. I'm not hearing this again. Because why? Well, just like we talked about. Their heart wasn't in it. And they were weeping about things that were not in line with God's truth. And there's a lot of people like that today. You know, I see people come, you know, and they're weeping about this. And I had a guy come and, you know, he was all teary-eyed over this girl. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, and uh, hearing the situation out and, and trying to be very kind and nice. Like, dude, you shouldn't be with this girl, man. <laughs> I mean, your heart's not right with the Lord, first and foremost. You're not following me. You're not in church regularly. You're not, you're not hearing. You're not doing devotions. You're not seeking the Lord. What His Word has to say, man. This is, I mean, I was nice about that. I wasn't like, so, you know, you know, anything like that. I felt like saying that, but you know, pulling me in mind. But, uh, <laughs> but no, it's just like, man, you know, there's a lot of people that get that they get teary eyed, weepy. I ain't saying don't be compassionate or nice, a cordial, kind. That's what we should do, but. They're doing it not as unto the Lord. They're, they're weeping about all kinds of other garbage that's unrelated to the will of God. <coughs> and, and, and that's what's happening here in this time. Now, verse 14, it says, you, Yet you say, for what reason? You do this thing, covering the altar with tears. We won't receive the goodwill. We won't really receive it. And you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. That's why I think the implication of weeping is over the relationships with the pagan wives. You and the wife are youth with whom you dealt treacherously. So God's indictment is he's going through these things in chapter one, the offerings are garbage. You don't bring these offerings. The priest, you're half hearted, you know, all this stuff. You know, look at your first ministry. God's telling you. You dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. With whom you dealt with treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. You made a covenant. You're married to her. Verse 15. But he did not make did he not make them one? Alluding back to Genesis, right? Jesus talks about that uh, in relating to this Matthew 19. Having a remnant of the Spirit, there's a oneness there. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Maybe some babies for crying out loud. No, <laughs> it's not. But no, there's, there's, there's a perpetuation of a heritage that's from God that's to be set forth. And you don't have to literally have physical babies to, as a, as a disciple of Christ to be a part of extending the heritage of the kingdom of God today. And I think that's something we should take into account as we follow the Lord. It's not necessarily just the physical offspring but we have a spiritual offspring, people being born again. Take heed, therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let no none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. First Peter 3 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. So there's this, you know, you may think her perception is limited and, 
You may think, you know, she's just a woman, you know, that's sold in her. But God's saying, dwell with them with understanding. Trying to get their perspective. And it's not always easy to do that. It takes humility. It takes, you know, turning the mouth off and, you know, getting the wax out the ears and maybe writing something down, you know, to really take note of it. This is your first ministry after all, right? As to the weaker vessel, God knows that men and women are different. Society's confusing it, but we know that as followers of Jesus, it's a practical thing. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, we're both inheriting grace from the King, for Him, Jesus. So you're looking at her as she's inheriting this kingdom that I'm inheriting. We're doing this together, you know. So there's this understanding, being on the same page, that your prayers may not be hindered. So apparently there's prayers that the Lord does not listen to, or they're not on the same they not listen to in this sense, but they're, they're, they're hindered. There's, there's, they're falling and bouncing off the ceiling, you know, coming back at you. You know, you're praying about this work thing, that thing over there, and you're not saying, dwell with your wife and understand me. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's an objective that God has that's mixed into the marriage relationship. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. There's that little instruction tool for us. Washing the water by the words. That's part of what we do. Right? This is for a husband. is helping wash her in the word. That he might present to her and he's using this comparative thing between him and Jesus and the church. That he might present to her himself a glorious church not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that he should be holy she should be holy by Christ should be holy and without blemish. So there's that constant back and forth with your spouse about the word. The word says this, the word says this. You know, there's that back and forth. What happens in those conversations? What happens in those conversations after a Sunday morning or a Thursday night or a seven week series back to Steve, right? <laughs> but, uh, marriage, but, you know, what happens in those conversations afterwards, you know? And the, just the back and forth, I think the supernaturally natural, you know, the Word of God is a part of the conversation that there's cleansing that happens there. Oh, I believe that, right? But anyway, it says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as they love their, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of the flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall be a father, and will be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. So it's something that, you know, talk about unsolved mysteries. Ministry, <laughs> ministry to end mysteries, right? Unsolved mysteries, right? Because it's kind of like a fascinating show, right? Well, this is one of the unsolved mysteries that should be compelling us, right? <laughs> As we walk with the Lord, is this ministry that we have with wife and how that relates to the gospel and Jesus relating to us. There's just so much interwoven in there that the Lord wants us to use as uh, to teach us. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's, it's really simple. It's, it's just imagining, you know, this is what's going on with your wife. She has a headache. Well, why would I respond to that headache? You know? It's a little tougher for me now because my wife's pregnant. My wife's pregnant. How would it be if I was pregnant? You know? <laughs> I'm going to put on one of those fat suits we use at youth thing, right? <laughs> Just walking around, what are you doing? I'm trying to identify with you. you know? But no, but, um, <laughs> that's real spiritual, ain't it? No, but it's, <laughs> but no, there's that, just, just the sensitivity of thinking, if she's feeling this, or she's thinking that, these are the connection points that help us connect to where she's at. It helps get us to understand, you know, not just questions. You know, uh, I kind of, I'm, I'm this kind of guy, I'm like, just write a list. You want me to do something? Just write a list. You know? <laughs> but, uh, versus extracting the list through conversation. But no, uh, but it's, it's the way of ministry. It's the way of ministry. The verse 16, back to Malachi. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. So 
So apparently there was a forsaking of the covenant with a person that was following God to like have some attire or some clothing, like my jacket, maybe just put it on the wife there. There was, there was a thing in marriages in that day that, that occurred. At least the commentary I read said that. But, <laughs> you know, but one garment, you know, but he's saying in this text, you know, one's garment is with violence. God is looking at it like that. From his perspective, this is like you're covering her, not just, you know, covering as a form of protection. You're covering as a covering that's one of violence. It's one of treachery, the way that you're dealing with your first ministry here. And it says, it says the Lord, folks, therefore take heed to your spirit. I think this is interesting how the Lord connects this. Not just, you know, that things would be practically better at your house, but this is yeah. a spiritual thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, that old thing, you know, mom ain't happy, nobody's happy kind of stuff. But, you know, this is take heed to your spirit, spiritually speaking, that, that you do not deal treacherously. Verse 17, you are, the one last point here connects to something else. Verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? I remember in chapter 1, I covered, the, there's like seven questions, I think, that people ask. I want to say seven, maybe eight. Yeah, they go online and watch that. But, you know, the, the people are asking throughout Malachi. This is the only one we see in chapter 2. In what way have we wearied Him? You weary the Lord with your mouth, your words. What way have we wearied Him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and He delights in them. You know, it's uh, really interesting. I was before I came over here, I was at home for a few minutes. And my wife was telling me a story. It's this you know, lady in the family, you know, connected to her grandma. And um, she's, she's, she's not, they're not married. I, I want to say they're just really not trying to follow the Lord. They would say they're, they would say they're Christians. They have been here before. But, um, you know, she's saying, you know, yeah, there's this guy. He's over there helping them out now with, with the baby. Because she, she's a young younger lady she has a baby with a guy she's not married to. There's another guy and I'm like, another guy? What do you mean another guy? It's like, yeah, it's this guy. Oh, don't worry, he's gay. Like, okay. <laughs> okay, he's gay. Okay. And what was he doing? Was he over there helping out? He said, well, he really tried to be heterosexual. I mean, he had three kids and a wife and, you know, and the grandma was like, yeah, he's just such a nice guy. He helps out. And they're just like lavishing this guy with like praising him and stuff. And it was like, wait, wait, does he have a job? No, he got a job right now and stuff. And just, uh, just hanging out, helping around the house with her and this baby. And like, did you repeat that slowly back to her? To let her think for a minute? You got a guy that's not working, has three kids, can't see him, didn't take care of him. And he's just hanging out over here. He's gay, I mean, you know, to boot, whatever. Something wrong there. I mean, <laughs> he's got three kids not taking care of him, not working. I mean, what does he got to do with his life, you know? I mean, even if he is, I mean, you know, go take care of your kids, man. But um, it's, it's just amazing just, just how people view things on a horizontal level. Just person to person. If you're nice to me, I mean, you could be like murdering somebody in the background or abusing your children or neglecting your family over here. But, but they were so nice to me. Let me tell you. Godly person. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the gist of what people say these days. And it, it's, it's sad. You know, it's, it's, it's a sad thing. But it's, it's often what's, what's, what seems to be happening. People, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I try not to describe. Well, I mean, I, I try to describe things and discipline my rhetoric for myself, but also in interacting with others. And I praise people so much as I, I praise God for working through people. You know, that, that's, I try, I want to do that. Why? Because, I mean, we're, we're still futile. We're, we're still in this sinful carcass, right? We're still, if we're really following the Lord, we're at the very, at least we're at the Romans 7 place in some ways. You know, when we're walking in the Spirit in Romans 8, we're like, woo! But, you know, but oftentimes we're in that battle. You know, what am I doing? The flesh is doing this and I'm trying to walk here, you know. We're in there. We're not good in it of ourselves. 
Paul says in me in the flesh is no good thing to dwell. <clears throat> then he says this last question. Or where is the justice of God? Where is the where is the God of justice? They're asking this question. These are the weary in words that they're throwing out. Well, if the God of justice showed up, it appears like you, you have a lot of poop on your head and in your face, according to the earlier verses. Because I mean, that's what he said he was rebuking you, saying he was going to do. I mean, you know, do you really want that? You know, or your table flipped over or whips driving you out of God's temple. I mean, you know, when, when we consider ultimately, and this is good for us as Christians just to consider, if I got everything every wrong that I've ever done, just isolated, each individual one, sharply examined for the wrong that it is. And you start multiplying and adding all of those together, man. I got the justice of God, I'd be obliterated. We all would be. And then but that's the flip side of, of what we can have in Christ. I mean, that's the gospel. We have Jesus who stood in that place to receive that punishment. And it's, we, if we do get caught up and we do mess up and we do things that aren't glorifying to the Lord or our heart comes in these places where our heart's not in it, it's important for us to turn back to the cross and to remember the strength and the glory of what Jesus has done in the cross to redeem us. And let that, through the Holy Spirit, propel us to want to pursue it. I think that's, 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 that's the place, the reckoning place when we come across the wrong behavior is, is, is coming to the cross of it and seeing that's, that's what he decided to do in place of my wrong and just being grateful for it. God, thank you. You're gracious. You're merciful. I'm doing the job one nine. I'm confessing. I'm agreeing. This is garbage. This is half-hearted. This ain't you. Lord, please forgive me. I trust what Jesus did. Give me power, God. Give me trust. And he gives you the Holy Spirit. I want you to move forward. I want you to continue to walk after That's the justice of God. I will Right? I don't want the justice of God for these guys, right? Alright, well let me pray and if we got more requests, we'll talk about that and we can shut off the thing after our prayer gets done. Lord, we thank you for, um, God, just thank you for your word to us tonight, Lord. Lord, it's a, it's a weighty word, Lord. I know in our culture we're, in a lot of ways, similarly, we, we're just, we're vulnerable to, to treating our relationship with you frivolously not taking to heart certain things that are precious and important to you, like our wives, perhaps, or, or other things. And um, Sometimes we find ourselves being that older brother, maybe. Um, the way we look at stuff. Or, or we're like, well, that's, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Lord, Lord help us. Help us just, just to simply turn back to the place where we can have forgiveness, where we ourselves can be cleansed afresh and anew and find power from your spirit, enablement to be doers of the word, Lord. Lord, you give us the power. You wouldn't set forth the precept or the promise or the command if you wouldn't give us the ability to do it, Lord. And you have, through the Holy Spirit, we can do all things through Christ. And so I pray that you would, uh, Lord, help us, God. Help me. I know as I Look at my walk with you. There's so many gaps and things that I need your mercy for. I need you to help me to, to tune up and, and get my head towards you versus towards something else. And I just pray that you would help each person in here to do that or whoever's listening to this to do just that as well, God. So we look to you to lead us and we trust you to do that now in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.